When you take out doctors, when you take physicians out of the equation and you replace them with dealers, which the law effectively did, it makes things even worse. So I'm very critical of the way the law was done. Like you said, we're not advocating anybody or everybody using steroids in any way. Uh, I, I think there is a discussion even whether whether we've become too vain as a society, you know, whether whether vanity, we've reached a point where, you know, the level of vanity oh, yes. is so out of control that on, on in both sexes, yeah. you know, or all, all genders, but, but, you know, and maybe we need to rein that back. Maybe, maybe we're going too far. Thank you to BetterHelp. That's Better H-E-L-P for sponsoring this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyons Show. In today's world, mental health is more impactful and important than ever before. We live in a world that is fast paced. Everything is going for our attention. There's social media, which of course can be valuable, but also can really send us down a nasty rabbit hole with technology is you don't have to be alone. And BetterHelp is amazing when it comes to getting therapy and having somebody to talk to. There is BetterHelp online therapy, which means you don't actually have to go anywhere. It's online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat only therapy sessions. You don't have to be in person if you don't want to. You don't have to be on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. You'll be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. This is really valuable. Again, we live in a very fast-paced world where we're exposed to things that we've never been exposed to before. And I do think that that greatly impacts our mental health. My listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Dr. Lion. That's better help H E L P dot com slash Dr. Lion. You will get 10% off your first month. Don't suffer alone and get the support that you need. So I was going to say, actually, Dr. Rick Collins, but it's um, it's not Dr. Rick Collins, no. but you're... <laughs> Rick Collins, ESQ, you know, Esquire, yes. I guess it would be. Yeah. I am, I'm a doctor of law, but... I medicine. am so excited to have you on. You, and for the listener who, and who doesn't know you, um, you are legendary. Okay. Wow. I mean, but hey, this is true. So, you know, there are some people that, you, you know, you say, oh, you know, like you're the best at what you do. And... You know, maybe someone will be like, oh, no, this person is not. But you are just incredibly well-respected. You are the leading steroid law lawyer, among other things, right? So yeah. no one ever wants to call you. <laughs> so, no, not about that, for sure. You but, know. yeah, um, you also are heavily involved in nutrition, yes. supplement companies. I mean, in the fitness space, you are the go-to. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky. I was able to blend my vocation and my avocation in a way. I mean, I was a competitive bodybuilder, so I, I've walked the walk and, you know, I've been uh, into health and fitness since I was long before I was in law school and uh, competed as a bodybuilder, worked as a personal trainer, ran a personal training company for a while. So that's really in my blood. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not like I could see some people go to an might go into an area of law as an opportunistic kind of thing. For me, it was just organic. I mean, I loved doing anything related to health and fitness. And when I, you know, got my law degree, I was a prosecutor for five years. You know, I liked the whole criminal justice space. And then when I went into private practice it was in 1990. And timing is everything. And we've talked, we, you and I have had many great conversations. And timing is everything, I think, in success, or it's a huge factor in it. And 1990 was the law that I hung out a shingle to go into my own practice with some partners. And it was the same year that Congress took anabolic steroids and put it into the same act with cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine and oxys. And so suddenly there was this huge disconnect between the folks in the gyms who had been using steroids as a adjunctive way of passing, you know, your genetic potential, you're getting bigger than you would have gotten otherwise, um, and kind of saw them as a super vitamin, I guess, didn't mm. think of them as as drugs in the sense of heroin and cocaine. And and then on the other hand, there were now the folks in the courts 
There were the cops and the prosecutors and the judges and the defense lawyers who did not have a clue what this was all about. And so I was kind of like in the right place at the right time to organically say, hey, let's bridge this information gap. And I wound up writing a book called Legal Muscle, which was about steroids in American law, culture, politics, medicine, sports, you know, all aspects of it. And that was uh, popular, sold out, um, and kind of put me as the on the map as kind of the go-to guy. Um, and I guess it's in that sense, it's crisis management. Right? It's like it's like being a <laughs> right. it's being an oncologist. Yeah, right? yeah. People don't see the oncologist because everything is going right, well. Right. You know, you've been diagnosed with cancer. This is a bad situation, and you need to go to somebody who really understands your particular type of cancer. Right. In a way, maybe that other oncologists don't understand it or have the knowledge. And so I had I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but on this particular topic. I, I just immersed everything. I, I learned everything about it. So, uh, you know, I've been able to help people with their di- their bad legal diagnosis um, for since since the early 90s. I love what I do. I really do. It's uh, you know, you hear a lot of lawyers that complain. I love what I do. I'm going to practice with other partners. The other partners don't do what I do. I've got a partner who does bread and butter car accidents, slip and falls, negligence. You get hurt, you have a serious physical injury. He's the guy to talk to. I've got partners that do bread and butter criminal defense with, with other types of cases. But my wheelhouse is really where health and fitness, especially like hardcore health and fitness, intersect with legal regulatory issues. I've done lots of cases involving athletes who test positive for a banned substance, whether it's steroids or SARMs or clenbuterol or whatever. And that's an interesting story I just thought of that we can talk about. But um, and I've, I've done a lot of work in the nutrition space. Yeah. So if you're a sports nutrition company and you want to bring your products to market, I work with – I have a legal team that does trademark work and contract work for any anybody who's looking to get into the space. So I love it. I'm happy. And uh, you're the best at what you do. Thank you. I think um, it's really interesting. You know, anabolics have this really negative connotation. But before 1990, number one, what even – describes an anabolic. So can you say, you know, someone comes to you and they're like, hey, Rick, what do we define as an anabolic? Right. So the law specifically defines an anabolic steroid Mm -hmm. as testosterone or various derivatives, uh, you know, synthetics that are related to it. Uh, The law has actually been revised twice since 1990, one in 2004, again in 2014. So it's like, how do you define steroids? Well, it's changed. It was a slightly different definition in 1990 than it was in 2014, and it is now. Um, but basically, we're talking about things that are are based on a steroidal, and, and you know that steroid is the term steroid is is so va- it, cholesterol is a steroid, exactly, birth control exactly pills are a steroid, point. obviously. Yes, exactly. um, anabolics are basically anabolic steroids or anabolic androgenic steroids, right. so they're based on the testosterone molecule. Um, and so um, what led up to that kind of... Like before 1990, right. weren't people able to go to their provider and was it legally say, hey, um, you know, what is a clinical indication for an anabolic steroid injury, um, p- perhaps low muscle mass, recovery from maybe a burn? Right. There were clinical indications sure. and nobody ever yeah. thought... And they didn't have the twice. stigma of the DEA... Right. Uh, and controlled substance status, which really makes the big difference. And what changed was, I, if we were to condense it down, I think it was Ben Johnson more than anything else. Ben Johnson was a Canadian sprinter who, in 1988 in the Seoul Olympics, ran really fast and, and broke the 100-meter record and then tested positive for Winstrel. And the sports world went nuts because he beat the American Carl Lewis. So you have this Canadian who cheated with steroids and beat the American. And so Congress got involved and started holding hearings. What are we going to do about this? these steroids, these anabolics in sports? 
and they looked at who's using and what's going on, and they decided that the way to deal with steroids in sports was to make them into the same, put them in the same act with heroin and cocaine and other drugs of traditional drugs of abuse, kind of like the orange in the apple crate of the Controlled Substances Act. It's the only hormone, hormonal it, I, substance I, listen, in it. Doesn't... I think it's so odd, which is why I wanted to uh, bring you on to talk about it, because anabolic steroids gets a hugely uh, bad rap, uh, sure. even though there are clinical indications for this substance. And not only that, testosterone is also naturally produced in the body. Uh, just saying. 100%. And... I think that it's really interesting that you would put, you know, that the Congress would put um, testosterone, testosterone derivatives in the same category as heroin, right. meth, amphetamines, right. Right. and cocaine. Yes. It's all in the same act. Different tiers, different levels of, of categorization within it. Uh, there's five categories of controlled substances but in, within the schedules. But, yeah, it's it's being treated the same way. The DEA can arrest somebody for the unprescripted possession. So like one tablet of Anavar, if it were to be found on somebody who didn't have a prescription, that's a federal crime. And that person could go to jail. And, and in some states, it's actually a felony because state laws followed the Congressional Act. And so some states made it a felony to possess any amount of a controlled substance, including an anabolic steroid. So Louisiana, for example, it's a felony. One, one D-ball tablet, and it's, it, you can be prosecuted for a felony. So um, I think probably it's, it's the only drug that is in the Controlled Substances Act, not primarily because of what it does bad for you, but because of what it does good for you. Tell me and, more. And that is... It makes you potentially run faster, jump higher, hit harder, perform better. And in a sports ethics kind of category, that's problematic because the idea is if you if you choose to use steroids and I don't and we're competing against each other in the same sport, it has a coercive effect on me in order to compete. Now, I have to do something that maybe I didn't want to do. And so that ethical issue just just stigmatized and poisoned testosterone and all the other anabolic steroids. And it continues to this day. It does. And a lot of that stigmatizing effect has been heaped on by those who, who want to stigmatize it. So like anti-doping authorities, they don't want people using steroids. They don't want athletes using steroids. So one way to do it is to try to stop them, to discourage them by either what they originally did was the American sports medical uh, establishment initially tried to convince athletes that steroids don't work. They, 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 it's, it's all, you know, placebo effect. Athletes were smarter than that. I mean, that, that was an idiotic uh, approach because, you know, w when you say something that's so patently ridiculous, you lose credibility on other things, including real side effects. And obviously, you know, there are side effects to anabolic steroids. And, like and by the drug. way, there are side effects to any drug. And Bingo. it's also very interesting that, it, you know, as a medical provider, uh, physicians can treat diabetes, obesity, uh, utilize drugs that perhaps uh, have a, a very big impact and perhaps a negative impact. Um, right. But anabolic steroids, again, as a provider, and we'll talk about what a, you know, what is the potential for a provider to, you know, what is legal versus not legal. There's a lot of, um, I don't want to say what's the word, red tape, but you can't legally, you know, it's uh, considered non-ethical or do no harm to prescribe something that, by the way, you mentioned, why would someone take an anabolic steroid? Improve performance, recovery, um, perhaps even osteoporosis or, you know, um, muscle mass issues. It just seems um, a little counterproductive. But you said something that I think is really important. You're talking about it from a... a elite athlete, Olympic athlete standpoint, what impact does it have on the general population? Right. So, and, and that's really the bait and switch of it all, right? Because the law was enacted to stop athletes in competitive sports from using steroids. Okay. I mean, 
I can think that there might have been other ways to do it, drug testing in the sport, et cetera, right. ways of addressing specifically athletes and what they do. You know, there was a time years ago that too much caffeine would be a, you know, would get you thrown out of the Olympics. You know, you would you would be uh, labeled a cheater. You would test positive if the caffeine content in your urine sample was over a certain amount. I think it was maybe the equivalent of like five cups of Starbucks or something. So five cups you of coffee. You mean my routine morning? Yeah. yeah. No, so I'm you're kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but that's the point, right? Yeah. Because, you know, okay, an athlete can be held to certain rules in sport, but why are you or I held to, I want to, if I want to have 20 cups of coffee, you know, that should be my, uh, my body, my choice of what I want to do with it. So, um, so rather than letting sports police steroid use within and doping issues within athletics, they kind of took the easy way out by saying, all right, let's just criminalize it for everybody. And the reality is, as, as you know, that the vast majority of people who are using anabolic steroids non-medically, not, not prescribed for hypogonadism or whatever, right. but using it for cosmetic purposes – um, that's 80% of the body of folks that are using it based on studies. And I was involved in a, a research project a few years ago. Um, and that's what we found. It's been confirmed in other studies. Sports performance is a small fraction of the folks. I mean, the, the it's mostly dudes. It's mostly guys in their 20s, 30s, 40s who – Want to look better when they take a shirt off. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. The guys that the individuals that are actually using anabolics, right? Is it's what you what I'm hearing you say is it's used for more vanity purposes sure. to put yep. on muscle mass, lose yep. body fat. Yep. Um, you know, and you know, you were saying like you could drink 20 cups of coffee and uh, smoke 20. You could actually drink 20 cups of coffee while probably smoking mm -hmm. a cigarette. Uh -huh. And then and eating at a fast food restaurant to food give food yourself a type two diabetes, and then yep. potentially elect to have a rib removed. Yes, to you have do a that. smaller waist. Right. Yes. However, um, anabolic an anabolic agent, right? Mm -hmm. um, that would potentially be used for vanity, obviously non prescription, um, is now in the same category as. Looked at more like heroin, yeah, like heroin. Yeah, so yeah, it, and and I've made the analogy very often to cosmetic procedures, cosmetic surgery procedures, right? So, which by the way has a risk of death. Bingo. Yeah, like people have died on the liposuction table. An immediate risk I mean, of death. Yeah, immediate risk of death, and and also risk of all sorts of terror. I mean, you just just look up you know, bad breast implant issues, and you'll see all sorts of horror stories. Mm -hmm. um, e even Botox and, you know, everything can have ne potentially serious uh, adverse effects. Um, but we allow that. We allow, I mean, it, it's ironic, right? So a guy wants to get more muscular. So he goes to his doctor and he says, I'd like to use anabolic steroids. Would you prescribe me a course of anabolic steroids? I want to, you know, I want my chest and arms to be bigger. Doctor says, absolutely not. That's a felony for me to do. Right. Get out of my office right. and never come back. Right. Goes to the plastic surgeon and says, doc, you know, I want my chest and arms to be bigger. Plastic surgeon says, great. I'm going to put some bicep implants. I'm going to put some pec implants. Right. We'll give you a tricep implant. Um Risks of general anesthesia, risks of infection from surgery, risks of death, as you say, uh, but that's okay, but the anabolics are not. And I think that it really comes back to the stigmatizing effect of sports doping, of sports cheating, because the cosmetic surgery doesn't give you a performance benefit. It's really that aspect of the Ben Johnson, the, you know, the, the bigger, faster, stronger aspect of steroids that has demonized it, even though the vast majority of people are not using it for that purpose. It's an interesting comparison, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that you can take all of these surgical cosmetic routes, they're perfectly okay, um, you know, look, there are risks of surgery, but there's also, look, there's risks of anabolic steroid use, absolutely. certainly. There's absolutely um, risk for anything. We should minimize them, obviously. There's potential yes. cardiac risks. There's, you know, short-term and potential long-term risks. And and the devil's in the dose, right? The old saying in medicine, right. yep. the difference between a medicine and a poison is the dose, right? So 200 milligrams of testosterone a week, 
but maybe maybe good for for maybe a lot of people, a lot of men of a certain age, right? Mm-hmm. Two thousand milligrams a week, five thousand milligrams a week, combined with some insulin and some growth hormone and some uh, cornucopia of other stuff, not going to be good. It's like the difference. Maybe a glass of wine a night, red wine, resveratrol, totally. you know, alcohol, you know, that thins your blood maybe a little bit. You like it? it it's nice. Um, a gallon of scotch a night, and you know, so and we've kind of. We've when we've presented steroids to the public, we've never addressed the, that sort of dosing moderation issue. We always look at it as if it's you know super physiologic doses of the highest level, and so you're going to get sick. Um, that's like saying don't take a glass of wine because your liver is going to rot out. Well, no, that's right. You know, you're you're extrapolating the worst possible you know highest dose amount to everybody, and that that's purposely done, I think, by those who don't want people to use anabolic steroids. Um, Why do you think that, you know, why do you think that that would be? And listen, I'm not saying everyone should be on anabolics. We're not even having that conversation. What we're having is a very transparent conversation about there were things in place that actually, I believe this affects the medical community. We are seeing a rise of, okay, like obesity, but the reality is that symptomology of, of impaired muscle, right. yet uh, a physician cannot treat that or there, you know, there has to be a very no specific question. clinical indication to treat skeletal muscle, but a physician could easily treat obesity and many of those drugs would have profound side effects versus a very tight uh, coarse dose of, say, something that could be used for a burn victim like oxandrolone sure. or nandrolone. I mean, and nandrolone has significant side effects, but um, it just I think that now what's happened is it's not even being looked at in research because right. it's, oh, my God, it's an anabolic steroid. And that really does a disservice to medicine and then to the aging population. Yeah. I'd like to take a moment and thank one of the sponsors of the show, and that's Element, L-M-N-T. Rick and I talk a lot about working out, and man, this guy is a beast, and you better believe that he keeps his hydration on point. Well, speaking about hydration, I want to tell you about Element and their new holiday flavors, which include chocolate caramel, and I hope that they keep that on there forever because it's amazing. It has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, no sugar, nothing artificial, no gluten if you care about that kind of thing. It's absolutely amazing. It is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs, and it's suitable for anyone following any kind of diet. Can't go wrong, whether it's keto, low carb, paleo, low fat, high carb, you name it, it's got you covered. Element can help eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue due to symptoms of electrolyte deficiency. Head on over to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion. That's drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. They offer no questions asked refund and you will get eight single serving packets free with any element order. Yeah, there's no question. It's put the handcuffs on doctors uh, in in ways that really, you know, and and I've spoken before often and written about the idea that the Anabolic Steroid Control Act, I mean, that's the word control, Mm. to control things in the 1990 law, actually completely took control away because it ballooned the black market. When there's demand, what happens? There's there's going to be supply. So when you took the doctors, like you said before, you could go to a doctor and get a course of anabolic steroids potentially prior to 1990. When you took doctors, pharmacists, uh, pharmaceutical companies all out of the equation by making this into a drug in the Controlled Substances Act, you you filled that gap that void was filled with black market dealers, uh, underground labs. You know that's really what the market is now. What, what totally? You know the, the the steroid market in America now is basically people who I've represented countless mm-hmm. underground lab guys, and what they do is they import raw steroid powders from China and they school themselves in the production process and they esterify these drugs into oil, oil-based liquids, and they 
put a, a home printer label on them and they sell them on Instagram. And so, so that's the current steroid market, but there's no physician oversight. There's no FDA quality control. You know, is there potential contaminants? Is, or, or, you know, is, is it underdosed, overdosed? Right. You know, what is the quality control of somebody doing it in their kitchen? You know, um, I think it's scary, and it, it, it is. But the but the ironically, it's the law that created this, right. or at least exacerbated, because when you take out doctors, when you take physicians out of the equation, and you replace them with dealers, which the law effectively did, um, it makes things even worse. So I'm very critical of the way the law was done. Like you said. I, we're not advocating anybody or everybody using steroids in any way. Uh, I, I think there is a discussion even whether whether we've become too vain as a society. You know, whether whether vanity we've reached a point where you know the level of vanity right, yes. is so out of control <laughs> that on on in both sexes, yeah, you know, or all all genders. But but you know, and maybe we need to rein that back. Maybe maybe we're going too far, and you know. Really, what is that extra half inch on your arm? Really, right. is that really where you should be focused in life? And and that's those are valid discussions to have. And maybe we should spend more time with who we are on the inside and not be so conscious of every little wrinkle and every little you know right. love handle or whatever. Um, and maybe part of that comes with maturity. Part of that comes with some insight over time. Um, but on the other hand, if we do allow all these vanity procedures in medicine, right. you know, why are we selectively disallowing this but allowing all those other things, which is, as you pointed out, some of them have higher risks uh, right. and potential immediate fatal risks. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think there really needs to be some reevaluation of the existing model. Do you model. think that that will happen? I mean, so it's funny you say that. Um, <laughs> you just happen to be on the board of so, our evaluation. So, well, yeah. so you know, it, it's. I would have said no probably a few years ago, and people have asked me that because look, I represent a lot of people in the in the steroid industry the oncologist, you know, the, the legal oncologist, right, right, right? right? When when the feds come into the house and they're executing a search warrant and they find, you know, 10 kilos of raw steroid powder and all of your glassware and your label maker. And so now, you know, this is not a good situation and you're going to call me on the phone as sort of the fireman to come in and right. try to, to spray the house down. Um, and, and I've been doing that for a long time. And so a lot of those clients will say to me, you know, many of them don't believe steroids are as dangerous. They, they don't believe some of the narratives and some of them may minimize the side effects for sure. Uh, some of them are aware and are very careful about, you know, ameliorating, mitigating some of those side effects. But they've asked me for for 25 years, I've been listening to, Rick, when is the law going to change? I'm not a federal drug criminal. I'm, I'm not like a heroin dealer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using steroids and I'm selling steroids to other people who you know, want to look better. Who am I really hurting? Government obviously has a very different perspective than that perspective. Um, but they're really, for years, I would have said there's really no... Um, Contingency. There's there's no coalition of of folks that would be advocating for for the legalization of steroids, unlike marijuana, for example, where there was a very strong movement which has borne fruit over time, and right. now we see these major changes where we're much more tolerant of marijuana, but no less intolerant of anabolic steroids. You know, very interesting. So I, I probably would have said we, we really just don't have, you know, the the lobbying mm -hmm. power or clout or credibility to get anywhere. Um, it's interesting that it's kind of changing and the, the uh, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows, they say, right? <laughs> so the, the hope potentially for some relaxation of the laws on testosterone is the LGBTQIA plus community. Mm -hmm. It's the trans community because the trans community 
uh, as it has become more of a, a powerful lobby in, in America, um, particularly those who are assigned female at birth mm-hmm. and who are looking to either transition to male or just to become more masculine along a, a non-binary spectrum can be prescribed testosterone to affect those changes in phenotype. Right. So be under the theory that it's got to be a disorder because testosterone is a controlled substance. So it's got to be prescribed for disease. Right. The disease is gender dysphoria. Hmm. In other words, I'm born in this woman's body, but I'm I'm a man or I'm not a woman and I want to I want a squarer jaw. I want broader shoulders. I want a more muscular chest and more muscular appearance. Maybe I want to have some beard growth. That testosterone can be prescribed for that person assigned female at birth to move along the spectrum toward masculinity. What about a male who wants to become more masculine? Ah, well, therein lies the rub, right? So the so the counterpart or or, or look, related, well, you know, like I say, more masculine. No, yeah, but you no, understand more muscular, masculine. Just curious more, as to how more, that works, right? So and there's a name for that disorder, and that's muscle dysmorphia. So muscle dysmorphia. Is is bigorexia, right? And I think almost every bodybuilder has it to some degree. I mean, let's yeah, let's yeah. let's admit you know reality, right? I mean, and by the way, I've known Rick for I, we've must known each other for at least a 15, good, 20 years. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it it is. And amazing. and by the way, we met actually at Bev's. We gym. did, yes, that's right. And yeah, where I still, you know, I'm representing Bev's. You know, you, shout out to Steve. Yeah, and you got Bev, you, so. And this is audio and video, so everyone can take a look at um, how you have always maintained being in shape. But um, you were talking about this or big orexia. So right, and and I think we all, to some degree, it, it's the nature of bodybuilding. You know, it's it's you you always right. see yourself as less than what you can be. You want to further that potential along. And, and you know, it can become pathological at some point, but I think we may overly pathologize it. I, right? I agree, because the majority of people, if you're thinking about it now, again, in the health and wellness space, we were talking about, you know, testosterone, and there's this huge influx of TRT clinics, which that was never like that before, right? right? It was, oh my God, you're going to this one doctor in Long Island. That's right. And everybody's going to this one doctor for testosterone. Right. Um, And now it's, you know, it's it's really opened up. But but that that kind of muscle dysmorphia, that big orexia that, um, you know, it's, if it can become you know, to a point where it well, impacts seen it. negatively, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, huh. either either medically, yeah. you know, from a health sure, perspective, sure. or even just from you know not participating in family events to you know to to really disconnecting in some ways from other parts of life. But um, but so but it's a similar disorder in a sense when you reach a certain point where if the guy is 180 pounds, but his Self image is of a guy 240 pounds with 8% body fat. Right. That's so I'm in the wrong body, right? right. I'm in I'm right. in this tiny little yeah. body, but I want to change my phenotype to comply more, to comport with how I see myself. Because don't forget, in gender dysphoria, we give the drug to enable that change, that physical change to support where you see yourself and make your body comport with that. And that's with perfectly mu- legal. And that's perfectly legal. In muscle dysmorphia, the doctor will say, get out of my office. I'll go to prison if I give you this drug because it is, you know, I, I just be supporting your steroid mm. use. So the, the the person born female who wants to transition to male to, to look more masculine right. can be prescribed it. The guy who says, I just want to put on 10 pounds of muscle, 15 pounds of muscle, so I feel more like how I, I, I look more like how I feel I should look, that there's no option for that guy at this point. So that, you know, the doctor can say, well, you can get some pec implants and, and bicep implants. So, but the, the, interestingly, the trans community is now lobbying under the, the uh, presentation that testosterone's status as a controlled substance is impeding access of for the those who are seeking tr- testosterone for the transition or to become more non-binary and um, 
two senators, two U.S. senators, have now taken the position that the law should be changed and that testosterone should be descheduled, either either lowered in the in the criteria, the um, classifications of of the Controlled Substances Act to Schedule Four or Schedule Five, or completely descheduled in order to facilitate the trans community having access to the drug. Now bodybuilders are going to me, wow, so my biggest advocate as a steroid-using bodybuilder is the LGBTQ community. And it's right now, yeah, because up until, you know, it took the trans community to get two U.S. senators Mm. to actually come forward with a position of taking away the stigma of testosterone. Um, where this will go, I don't know, um, but it's it's the first forward movement we've had in this area in you know since 1990. And you uh, specifically talking about testosterone. Does that also include testosterone derivatives? So right now, no. Right now, no. And I remember reading, and I, I think I linked it on some of my social media. Uh, I remember reading this article uh, written by a person assigned female at birth talking about how testosterone changed their life by and, and this person didn't want to become a man this person just wanted broader shoulders a heavier beard a squarer jaw arguably kind of cosmetic changes you know which and was prescribed testosterone to make those cosmetic changes because they're related to self image i'm not so sure that's that is all that different from the average guy who just wants broader shoulders, right? You know, bigger bags, bigger, bigger biceps. So it's stay tuned. This is a, a kind of a a hot issue. I've been lecturing about it a little bit. Um, I wrote a, um, I co-wrote with a few other uh, authors a a piece that was in the Journal of Addiction about kind of comparing this. You know, so if you're a f- born female with gender dysphoria. You get testosterone to change the way you look so it matches how you want to look. If you're a man with muscle dysmorphia who wants to change the way you look to be more in lines with how you want to look, not only don't you get testosterone, but you go to jail and so does your doctor if you do it. And we weren't advocating necessarily that muscle dysmorphia guys get testosterone, but just somebody's got to comment on the disparity that gap of you know in you know here we're we're celebrating your transition to here you're going to go to prison or at least get a criminal record which is going to prevent you from certain jobs and and You're certain saying it licenses. should just be um less of a distance between the yeah. two yeah we need to we need to somebody's got to at least the policymakers need to recognize wow you know and when i say this to people they're like I never thought of that. You know, it's like light bulbs go off and nobody's really addressed that issue, that disparity. Wow. So in other words, are a lot of the guys who are using steroids maybe suffering from some level of muscle dysmorphia? Mm -hmm. And should we be arresting them? Or is there some other way we should be dealing with this? Yeah. And, And, you know, having represented thousands of guys in that and and some women in steroid related SARMs related you know all sorts of performance drug related stuff um certainly steroid abuse can be bad for you physically and and bad things can happen i've seen some of that also but i've also seen how the law has impacted you know this this interdiction effect you know we're going to stop you from using steroids to save you we're going to arrest you and you know do all these things mm. and convict you and i've seen people's lives completely derailed because of the legal consequences of the current steroid law model which is you know as you probably know you get a criminal conviction even a misdemeanor conviction for the rest of your life in in many states you've got a chick that box, have you ever been convicted of a crime? You've got to check yes on that job application, on that loan application, you know, on, on so many licensing applications. Um, the, the effects of a criminal conviction, the negative effects um, on people's lives are prof- and their families are profound. And so um, I think we can do better. I think yeah. we can come up with a better approach. I'd like to take a moment to thank one of the sponsors of the show, and that is First Form. 
I have been working with First Form, that's P-H-O-R-M, since at least, I would say, 2018. They have so many great products, I wouldn't even know where to start. They have peppermint everything and anything that you can imagine, like protein powder, like collagen. They even have beef sticks, believe it or not. What I want to highlight today is really focusing on muscle health, no surprise. And a few of my go-to products are First Form's creatine. That is really important for muscle health. It's also important for brain health. In addition to omegas. So Full Mega is an excellent omega-3 product. And this is very important for muscle health as well as brain health. And in fact, omega-3 fatty acids may be even more helpful to women who are aging as it relates to muscle health. And uh, that's something that I think is often overlooked. So if you are interested, head on over to firstform.com. That's P-H-O-R-M.com slash Dr. Lion. They offer free shipping which is amazing. And if you want to get a gift for somebody, uh, I'm a size small. If you wanted to get me some of their pants or apparel, which is incredible. All all kidding aside, uh, those are some bad jokes, but truly they make an amazing apparel line as well. Go over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion for free shipping on everything. You know, you mentioned something that I think is important. You said both the patient and physician will can go Sure. To, to jail. What does a physician need to think about, look at prior to prescribing testosterone and I think testosterone analogs or testosterone derivatives? Yeah. So uh, I just gave a, a lecture out in Albuquerque, uh, at, New Mexico. Um, it was one of the, the medical conferences, amazing. anti-aging conferences. Which, which you do. Uh, which you I do a give, number of them. Yes. Yeah. So um and uh, I spoke to a you know 400 or so doctors about this very topic, and that is you know the legal aspects that surround prescribing growth hormone, synthetic you know androgens, testosterone, um, and we could we could go into a, you know a whole show just on that alone. Maybe just but, a handful of the big, you so, know, maybe the top three right. things that um, physicians need to know, like clinical indication. You have to document that as a clinical indication. Yes. Like what are some of those things that you say, these are the low hanging fruits that you guys are not doing and you should do? So so for starters, even before you get to that, marketing. So I see some of these clinics and anti-aging practices marketing either in print or online, the using these muscular, you know, bodybuilder type images, um, that's a red flag for somebody in a regulatory capacity saying, is this a medical practice or is this really just a a steroid prescribing practice for non-medical purposes? And that's really the if, if there's you know the the dividing line for the legality with all of this is whether it is medical or non-medical because, as a controlled substance, testosterone and all the other anabolic steroids have to be prescribed in the ordinary course of practice for a legitimate medical purpose. And, you know, bigger jack, you know, another 20 pounds on your bench press or another half inch on your biceps is not a medical reason. But, you can, but you, reason. Can inject in, you can inject Botox for wrinkles. Absolutely. Cosmetically fine, but Botox is not a controlled substance. So that is point, what the point. controlled yeah. substance status that was heaped on steroids in 1990 does. So it, that's the limitation. Mm. So when doctors think about prescribing, they really have to think about whether this appears to be a medical or a non-medical purpose. So some of the things that happen, um, marketing is one, who your patients are is another. If you've got athletes, if you've got 20 and 22 year olds, if you've got, and sometimes I see like cops and firefighters, find out that there's a doctor who's prescribing right. testosterone and, and some other stuff. And suddenly the waiting room is filled with a bunch of bodybuilders and, you know, very fit guys. Um, diagnost- diagnostics, you know, what is the, the reason for it? Is he hypogonadal? Um, is there some other, what is the purpose of the prescription as to be a medical purpose? Um, documenting everything, um, and I've seen situations where undercovers, uh, undercover cops go in to try to get a doctor to prescribe 
under circumstances that would indicate that it's that there's real really no medical need. And usually when they do that, initially it appears like there's a medical need and they slowly, after a little bit of trust, kind of get the doctor to loosen up a little bit more. It's some similar to what they do in to pain meds. Mm-hmm. You know, there are pain med doctors, pain management uh, practices, and um, DEA or others will send in undercovers to try to see if the doctor will prescribe for what's kind of shady reasons. And that could be a, a prosecution. So where does the concept of optimization come in? Then, so basically, what I'm hearing you saying is, okay, let's say you know they've moved the range for hypogonadism and low levels of testosterone. Right. So I think what low levels of testosterone, you know, they they keep moving it lower and lower and lower, mm-hmm. and um, right. you know, so if someone looks at a a lab and it's their morning testosterone and it's 330. Right. You know, maybe they're like one point Just above. Just one point above, yeah. They're, they're right. not technically hypogonadal, right. but, right. you know, h- how does that play out for the quality of life for the patient? Yeah, not not well, because there's, there's an ideological split, right, between conservative orthodox endocrinology and the brave new world of anti-aging, age management, whatever you want to call it. And they're completely different philosophies. Orthodox endocrinology basically is that unless you have 200 nanograms per deciliter and are wildly symptomatic, if you have the testosterone levels of your grandma, uh, then maybe, maybe we'll prescribe it for you. Other than that, no way. And of course, you know, the, the, the more progressive medical community in age management and anti-aging medicine is like, well, wait a minute, there's, there's all these concepts of optimization or even like relative hypogonadism, right? Totally. So, what about the protective effects of testosterone? hundred um, percent. And let's, let's say my testosterone levels when I'm 30 are 800 and now I'm 40 and now they're 500. Is there a difference in my quality of life? Possibly. And now let's say they're, you know, 350 at 50. They were 800 and now they're 350. If you don't have that sort of idea of, of relativity to, right. to these levels, um, you're still within normal range. And under the more orthodox view, you don't get any testosterone no matter what your symptoms are. So I, I think, you know, we've talked about this before. Most doctors get no training on anabolic steroids in, med- in medical school. How much, how much time did, did, were you introduced in medical school to testosterone and anabolic steroids? Not at all that I know of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have friends who are nephrologists. I have friends who are all areas of medicine. You know, they they ask me questions. You know, and and that's a that's kind of a problem. Um, and and my experience even with endocrinologists is that they don't know all that much about testosterone. They know more about estrogen. You know, the, certainly um, estrogen replacement. They do a lot of and thyroid. Most right. of them do lots of thyroid medication, but less so in testosterone. And so that's I think given the the you know um, supply and demand aspect to why we have this rise in these clinics that are more forward thinking in terms of, well, wait a minute, just like women's estrogen levels drop, men's testosterone levels drop. So how drop. do we reconcile? How do, um, you know, the two kind of philosophies of medicine, how does that get reconciled in terms of legality, <sighs> yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Legally. Um, yeah. It's, it's still not clearly. So, and I've represented physicians in the category of the age management physician, some of whom maybe went a little bit too far in some of the red flags that we talked about, maybe, you know, started doing things that that were more questionable, um, some not, uh, who wound up in front of medical licensing boards. And guess who's sitting on those medical licensing boards? The orthodox endocrinologists. So you're sitting there in front of three endocrinologists and and the doctor is being questioned and they're asking, well, you're an emergency medical physician or, or you're you're trained in, you know, podiatry or whatever it is. Um, what made you think that you could make a practice out of doing what we do? 
you know, we are the hormone people. We're the endocrinologists. What, what made you think of, well, I, I learned a lot in, you know, anti-aging classes I took and I got a certificate and that didn't fly well. So, so we still have kind of a collision course. And the way to avoid, I think, is to be selective in terms of patients, to, to be careful in terms of doses. Obviously, you know, if they subpoena patient records and they see people are getting 400 milligrams, 500 milligrams of androgens a week, um, the, anything that indicates non-medical purpose is problematic. Mm. You know, uh, there is a rise in sarcopenia. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just there are these things that I think are, you know, I'm hoping that um, muscle disorders, muscle disease, skeletal muscle deficits, that these things um, really come to the forefront more so mm -hmm. that individuals can reevaluate treatment. Um, and I mean, medical professionals to really just be able to reevaluate, you know, what is the quality of skeletal muscle tissue? You know, just recently got an ICD 10 code, even though sarcopenia right. has been mm -hmm. around for a long time, right. just yep. recently. Just recently, yep. And I which think is, which is great, you know, uh, yeah. and a step in the right direction. I mean, look, muscle mass is you know, starts I mean, to go bye bye yeah. over time. And you actually have been talking and writing about this. You wrote this this book, the Alpha Male Challenge, which you know you are definitely one of the ultimate alpha males. Um, and you know you have been so successful and so capable your whole life that it's interesting. Your all these conversations that you're seeing now, as it relates to. Um, nutrition and fitness. You've been kind of talking about this yeah. for decades. Yeah. So, and, and that really goes back to those studies that that first identified the generational decline in men's testosterone, mm. as 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 you know well. Um, the the idea that our grandfathers, as dudes, our grandfathers' testosterone levels on average were higher than our fathers. Mm. And our fathers, on average, were higher than ours. So we're, we're having this generational decline, even separate and apart from sort of the individual decline after the age of 30, and it starts to, to go down your own individual levels. But as a generation, our testosterone levels are going down. And what can we do to kind of combat that? And how do we get our manly mojo back? And that was really, I co-wrote that, that book, Alpha Male Challenge. Mm -hmm. I guess we, we were working on it 15 years ago to address that issue, you know? Um, how do you get your alpha back? You know, and, and is it okay? And it was kind of the book was sort of like how to be an alpha male without being an asshole. <laughs> that was essentially right, it, you right. know, it, it, alpha in the best sense of it, in in the sense of you know, courage and bravery and and resilience and you know, overcoming obstacles and all the the good aspects of it, which unfortunately. You know, the American Psychological Association now with its position that traditional masculinity is toxic or harmful um, kind of misses the point. I mean, there's there's so much good of it. And um, we were going to do an, an alpha female challenge uh, eventually. But what we found was I think that's that, a great idea. Well, what, what I found was that so many women contacted me having read the book, The Alpha Male Challenge. And said, well, this applies to me and I'm following, it's a 10 week program. I'm following your program and I feel great and it's really making changes. And it's about, there's a nutrition aspect of it. And, and my nutritional philosophies are totally on, on point with yours. We could talk about the, the importance of protein intake in the diet, you know, the, the value of, of meat in the diet, yeah. um, the, the difficulties of following a vegan diet, um, and of course, there's a training component of it, and and we have cardio stuff in the book. But you know, the the core is is resistance training, and yeah. that's really close to my heart, close to your heart. The importance of resistance training when we talk about sarcopenia, when we talk about osteoporosis, osteopenia, the you know, especially for women. You got to hit those weights. You got to totally. push the weights and not the pink dumbbells, not not the five pounds. Hey, don't judge my dumbbells. No, just kidding. I, I don't have pink dumbbells. But yeah, I know you don't. I've um, seen you train. So no, you're 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 the badass who's out there doing it, and you believe it, and you've walked the walk like I have in this. Um, so yes, diet resistance training, and and I was a psych major uh, undergrad. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so I came from that background. I was going to be a psychologist, and then I did, I wound up getting a free ride to law school. I, I did very and well by the academically. Way, did, people, did people always underestimate you because you were the kind of like the jock? So I'll, I'll tell you that that story in a minute. But the um, 
the other component to the book was was really attitude. And and that was really where I wanted to do something that talked about kind of applying the same principles that we apply to bodybuilding, which is stressing and growing from that, you know, from that stress to the to sort of like growing your attitude and your character. And so we even had like th- this idea that, you know, nothing grows in a safe space. Even before there were safe spaces, right. the the idea that, you know, you need to be stressed, you need to, you know, have resistance and you need to overcome that resistance and that's how you build resiliency. Resiliency is built by overcoming adversity. If there's no adversity, you never grow. Nothing grows in a safe space. You know, you you need to have challenge. And that's was sort of like the alpha male the challenge aspect was it was was about challenge challenging yourself, finding ways to to go beyond your comfort zone, to force yourself out of it. And I've done, back at the time that I wrote the book, I was I was getting a little queasy with heights at some point, and, oh, and I never had you it jumped before. Jumped out of a plane. So I yeah, remember. so I just oh, said, you know God. what, I'm going to do this. Yes. I did it for charity because I figured you like do it every year now or something. I, I wound up getting my skydiver's oh, license gosh. and stuff um, because it, I yeah. was, whatever terrifies you is what you need to do. Thank you to one of the sponsors of the show, and that is Inside Tracker. To live your healthiest, longest life possible, you really do need to understand what is going on in the inside. And hey, take a look at Rick. Rick Collins is just an absolute beast of a man, and you better believe he's on top of his health. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. Are you ready? They're offering $200 off Insight Tracker's ultimate plan or 34% off the entire store. This is extremely generous of them, and I really appreciate it. Inside Tracker provides personalized health analyses, clear recommendations, plus an action plan. Inside Tracker can also calculate your biological age, which, by the way, I am 25, in case you are wondering uh, the rate at which you age compared to your chronological age. So go over to Inside Tracker dot com slash Dr. Lion for $200 off their ultimate plan or 34% off the entire store. This is for a limited time only. I really do think that blood work is so valuable. This eliminates the friction to getting it, and uh, it allows you to be more in control of your own health. What, what scares you the most? And I talk to people. On, have you ever done a skydive? No. Okay. So are you afraid of doing one? Yes. Okay. Perfect, because you're the one who needs to do it. Absolutely because not. Hard pass, I, zero chance. I am telling you, I'm telling you that there are people who are like adrenaline junkies, and they do a skydive, and they're like, "Yeah, this was great," you know, uh, you know, I want to do it again, and it's it's nice, but but it's not like a game changer. If you are terrified, if you are absolutely terrified of doing it. And you do it. You, it. It'll be rough. I'm telling you now. It's 20 minutes coming up to altitude. The side door of the plane is open. You're looking out at the horizon, the, the curve of the earth, and, and out you go into the void. And you have to say, before you go out, you're sitting there. And, and I've done it both standing and sitting. As a bigger guy, they'll usually want you to sit because if you freak oh, out, you'll God. try to pro- not get out. But you actually have to say at that moment, look statistically, this is going to be fine. I mean, it is. It's statistic. Really? Yes. There's, you know, All it's right. safer than driving. If no. you look at the statistics, the, the, the very, very, very small number of fatalities is, and if you go to a, a good drop zone, and I'll refer you, I have a good drop no, zone in New Jersey, <laughs> actually. Um, so, you know, yes, it, it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. But in that one in a million chance that it's not okay, you're going to be splattered across the you horizon. You just say, F it. And you just, it, it requires almost like a release of, of everything. And you you just go out there. And when you land safely, which you will land safely, I, I guarantee you will land safely. When you land safely, you because, how, uh, because of the level of terror that you had about it, you will feel like you have kicked death in the nuts. <laughs> like you have... You have a feeling of this almost like, you know, inhuman, Im- almost immortality that that in your mind, you were, it was certain death and you have transcended death in this incredible way. And that feeling of empowerment, I'm telling you, that feeling of empowerment will stay with you forever. 
it is, I highly recommend it. Trust me, think about it at least. Don't, don't say a hard no, because the more afraid of it you are, the more you'll get out of it. But, and, and so, so the book is, is about doing okay. things like that and, and finding the way to, to challenge yourself because that's how you grow. Mm-hmm. You only grow when you challenge yourself. Totally, totally um, agree with that. And when, to get back to your question about- Wait, so, and also, uh, by the way, I don't want to miss the opportunity to hear about uh, testosterone and women. Yes. So, so, so the, you know, when you, when you ask, you know, underestimating. So I had been competing in bodybuilding in college. And by the way, people should know you're like six. How tall are you? I'm, I'm like 5'11. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is at, right. But in my mind, you're like 6'4. Thank you. Yes. You're like, uh, you yeah. I, I have, well, I, large. I, I guess I, my width, you know, large implies human, more lo- height. But you're actually yeah. like kind of a, a larger human. Thank you. Yes. Um, and I'm just curious, did people, you, you know, you show up back when you went to law school, by the way, on a full scholarship. Yes. People are like, so, oh. but nobody really knew that. So, so I went, I started law school and I was, you know, looked kind of like, you know, big muscly guy. <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, there are assumptions that people make back, back then more. I think it's changed now mm. and there are more fit people in law schools right. and, and medical school. But back then, it was very rare to have somebody who was spending a lot of time in the gym in a law school. And they didn't know what to make of me. And so I think there was this idea that, you know what, he's he's probably going to drop out. He's going to fail out in the first semester. He's never going to make it. Um, and so I had to kind of being who I am, I guess, uh, make a decision of how I wanted to deal with that. So, and rather than trying to convince them that I was smart, um, I kind of doubled down on the meathead. So I would come into law school oh, wearing a hat <laughs> on backwards and like back then it was like T. Michael, like boat neck oh sweatshirts and, and you know, the pants, you know, the, like the pajama pants with all the different mm-hmm. colors, you know. And so uh, so I kind of doubled down on on that stuff to sort of, you know, mess with them. And I wound up writing on the law review, you know, I, I did very well academically and I was there on probably one of the few who was there on a full academic scholarship, but, um, but I had fun with that. So yeah. And I didn't, you know, it it is disturbing that there are certain assumptions that are made about, you know, muscularity, at least back then, and even to some degree today. And, and I think obviously you, um, and, and, and me, um, kind of defy those stereotypes. And I think, that's good for the bodybuilding community, you know? Um, and I've written a lot about kind of what I've learned as a, as a bodybuilder and we could talk about success and, and kind of how we, how our, our experiences craft that, um, competitive bodybuilding, I, I think teaches you sacrifice, um, you know, resilience, overcoming, you, know, you get injured, there's, you got, you have setbacks. How do you get around? How do you figure out, how do you navigate your path to success? Um, discipline, consistency, you know, um, nobody gets a, a 19 or, uh, you know, my 20 inch arm, you know, nobody gets that. Right. I posted that on Instagram, <laughs> with the tape measure, <clears throat> but you know, nobody gets that overnight that you get it by day in and day out, hard work, thinking about it, smart work, and those lessons of being a successful bodybuilder, you can apply to whatever it is that you do. And and so I'm I'm grateful to be able to have had sort of these these two, you know, maybe it's mixing into a unicorn, but these two things of, you know, my academic and my my legal and professional background and my, you know, background as a as a bodybuilder and a physique competitor to um to be able to kind of meld them together. And I think that the guys really respect you and they feel like you understand that you're gonna <clears throat> really go to bat. Yeah. For them, which I which and I, I do, think is and, and I and I do, valuable. and yeah. you know, it, it's funny, uh, you know, a lot of, and I've said this recently on on social media, you know, I, sadly, I do represent some of my friends who get in criminal trouble, uh, but more often my clients become my friends. And so my social media following, if you looked through it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'll sometimes see it and I'm like, I'll see so many uh, guys and, and, you know, yes, we talk about law and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I work super hard and I, I won't be outworked in still, my defensive still, people still, even to even this day, to this day for how long? 100%, 100% since, um, 
Well, I, I 1990 is when I started my practice, but to this day I, I work. I will not be outworked. But it, it's kind of cool that my clients will also want to talk to me about training, training and nutrition, and so and so I can relate to them. I mean, there are so many of my clients are like similar to the guys that I, my training partners or, yeah. you know, uh, people I would ask to spot in the gym. So, so for me, it's fantastic. Um, and yes, I think they understand that you know, I'm not a lawyer who's, you know, judging them in some way or not understanding. There's a, a great connection. So, so I love what I do. Um, and I've, uh, you know, we also represent a lot of companies in sports nutrition, and so a lot of those people we can we can hang out and discuss, you know, nutrition, training, you know, all of the stuff mm -hmm. that y you and I think about outside of our of our you know professional lives. Yeah, you know, I um. I, I love that, and actually, you do have that reputation. Everyone is is pumped when Rick's around. Um, in terms of women. We talk a lot about testosterone in men, but what about testosterone regulations in women? And you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, if you look at the the labs again, it's the range is huge about the right. low end to the high the high end of what is um, normal for a female. Right. How does someone rec reconcile that in terms of legality? Yeah, and it bit number one, do no harm to the patient, and in the best interest of their. Um, like how they feel. Well, from a from a legal standpoint, uh, the same laws would apply. The same restrictions would apply for women as for men. And that is, a doctor who's prescribing testosterone to a woman and wants to not have a legal issue has to make sure that it's a not it's a, a medical and not a non medical purpose. Um, and I have seen. Women prescribed steroids or or testosterone or other anabolic steroids by physicians, and their records showed that they were competitive athletes, that they were they were in physique, bodybuilding, wellness, right. whatever. Right. And that's kind of a red flag for you know um, doctors have to be careful. Not that people who are in fitness can't be you know can't need a, a medical dose of testosterone especially as, as you know we've talked about before you know men who abuse steroids for a long period of time can compromise their own endogenous right. production of testosterone and then need testosterone um but that has to be carefully um written out um and the same would be true with women making sure that it is clearly a medical purpose uh and and that there's nothing there that's not medical um one of the things i talked to the doctors about in prescribing testosterone in my my recent talk was um that if there are symptoms I, I've seen discrepancies between what the patient writes on an intake form mm -hmm. and what the doctor's note is in terms of symptomology. So, for example, I saw one where the patient wrote down no problems with libido or erectile functioning, and then the doctor wrote it down in his in his notes right. um, as a justification for the prescription. And it was a medical review that was going on, and that was – that was cited as a, a problem for the doctor, that, that you know, a credibility issue. Uh, and the reality is sometimes people won't write down, 100%. but they'll orally tell you. 100%. And so it's super important for doctors, just one little tip for doctors, if that happens, to write down oral, you know, patient stated orally, and then what that is, so that that takes care of that potential discrepancy. Mm. What are some of the biggest questions people are asking you lately? It seems like things go in seasons for you. People have, you know, there was people were asking a lot about HCG mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe it was Clomid and then it was compounding pharmacies and then it was off-label use. Is there something that's really hot right now? Um, I think SARMs have been a big issue because SARMs have been in not only the, the medical uh, aspect, but the nutritional aspect. So there have been a lot of companies that were selling SARMs labeled as dietary supplements. Selective and antigen receptor modulators. Yes, yes, which are, you know, we could define them as, you know, they're not steroids, but they do have some anabolic properties. They have some potential side effects as well. And so, and they certainly don't qualify as they don't meet the criteria of a dietary supplement or a dietary ingredient. Um, but people are selling them anyway, and usually in mom and pop 
dietary supplement stores and health food stores. And so, um, so a lot of people continue to think that they're okay to sell as dietary supplements. And I've written about this. I've, I've spoken about it, uh, you know, I've, until I'm blue in the face, but there's always some, there's, there's very little bar to entry in the supplement industry. So somebody wants to open up a, a supplement brand and they get a contract manufacturer to white label their, their products and they put their own label on it and they sell it. And, um, there's, you know, there's, there's no FDA approval necessary for a dietary supplement product. So um, so you can have these products that are on the market and a continuation of the belief that they're okay when they certainly are, are not okay. Um, and I've seen all sorts of issues with dietary supplements. I represent a lot of people who test positive in sports doping scenarios, um, which, uh, you know, I had a uh, I had a, a police officer not too long ago who tested positive for clenbuterol in, in a major metropolitan police department drug screen. And for people who don't know, clenbuterol is, is it traditionally an asthma drug? Is that yeah. So it's a beta-2 agonist. Yeah. Um, and in this country, we have something called albuterol. So it's for bronchodilation and asthma issues. So we use albuterol. But in some other countries, they use this this clenbuterol still still uh, but it's not it's not approved in the US so you can't you know you can't prescribe it in the US but bodybuilders have used it there's some recent research indicating that in addition to its more traditional fat burning use bodybuilders will typically use it be pre contest um, to get more definition. Mm -hmm. um, there's also evidence and growing evidence that it has anabolic properties also. Um, so you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. Is there a reason why it was taken off the market? Uh, albuterol has just, you know, been the drug of choice here. So, um, so you know, he tested positive for it, swore that he hadn't used clenbuterol. Um, I looked at the policy of the police department and the policy was, anti-steroid and growth hormone. So you'd be tested for steroids and growth hormone. And I remember speaking to the prosecutor and saying, okay, he tested positive for clenbuterol. Yes, we have a zero tolerance policy, she said. Okay, but zero tolerance of steroids and growth hormone. Yes, but this isn't steroids or, or growth hormone. I know, but we have a zero tolerance policy. So it was this circular, insane conversation. What, what does one even do with that? I had to try the case. I spent uh, a week in the trial room. I wound up calling an expert and cross-examining their experts. They had the the architect of, of the Major League Baseball um, you know, steroid yeah. program as one of their witnesses. And ultimately, he was acquitted in the trial room, which is fairly rare. But, um, and did but I had he to lose go through job? that whole process. No, he kept his job because he was acquitted. Okay. He, he, he we. I, I did my job. I won. I, I beat the uh, the other side up pretty well, and um, and so he he did well. And I've I've seen many situations where drug tested athletes can use a, a dietary supplement and test positive because of some trace contaminant that's in that product. I represented the number one middleweight boxer in the world, Sam Solomon, who was an Australian boxer a few years ago. And uh, he tested positive for methylsinephrine, which is not on the label of any of the products that he was using, found it, in fact, it was a, a contaminant. It was inside one of the products. And I wound up, that was a, one of my international cases. I wound up fighting the Germans because he had beaten the, the German oh, champion, God. Felix Sturm yeah. in Dusseldorf. And, and the Germans don't like when you beat them in, you know, in a boxing match. And he was like their, their Aryan golden boy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so they wanted to take away Sam's ranking and, you know, cast him out into space. And I was able to, to fight and, and ultimately got his ranking reinstated. Mm -hmm. And he went on to beat Felix Sturm in the next fight and go on to the next fight and get a million dollar purse. So it was Amazing. a happy, a happy thing for, for him. Amazing. Do you think that there are, do you think that there are trends that are increasing in persecution of kind of not performance enhancing stuff like, um, you know, above and beyond testosterone? But do you think that there with this um, push of kind of um, closing the disparity between those that are transitioning from male to female and also those that have this um, muscle uh, dysmorphia kind of a thing, do you think that? 
um, that's going to pave way for other things to be uh, reevaluated. I'd like to think so. Um, I think the the journal article that I wrote with two, two co-authors uh, and is that published. available? Can we? It is. We'll link that. Yes. Okay. And um, it's uh, it's just the beginning of of I think nobody's really thought about that disparity in treatment. Um, and and hopefully it'll it'll begin to get people thinking of is this really the right way to go? You know, we've we've completely changed our tolerance with respect to some drugs, you know, and in obviously we've got like what, the legalization of marijuana, uh, yeah. you know, throughout. And I think at some point it's going to happen federally. Um, Colorado legalized all drugs. The, 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 they decriminalized the possession of all drugs under, I think, the idea of that, that criminalizing people who are addicted to heroin or, or meth or whatever is really not helping them. And so it should be looked at as more of a, a public health issue instead of as a, a criminal justice issue, which I think isn't necessarily bad if it's if it's combined with some sort of treatment and rehabilitation, not just enabling right. the continued use, which sadly I think happens more than it should. But, um, but steroids were were lumped in as well. So in the state of Colorado, steroid possession mm. is okay. It's it's not, you know, in, in small amounts, it's decriminalized. So um but but it's not because anybody in the Colorado legislature was thinking, we need to do something for those poor steroid users. You know, they're they're becoming criminalized and their lives are ruined by these these laws. It was they just happened to be you know, in the same act, mm. which in sympathy for the real addicts, um, they were were carried along Interesting. to salvation. Interesting. <laughs> what about off-label use for medications? Does that ever come up? Yeah. So, um, and just in in general terms, it's okay for physicians to prescribe off-label. In fact, most drugs, most drug prescribing is off-label prescribing. Um, it has to be based on good, sound medical judgment. You can't prescribe a drug for something it wouldn't do anything for and um, might be medical malpractice. But it would be that but, the FDA is not approved. So, for example, let's see something would, um, you know, maybe like an antidepressant at you know, is FDA approved for or an SSRI or some kind of drug within the um, psychiatry realm is approved for antidepression, but maybe use it for a different medical for indication. A medical indication, a lower dose would be sleep. Right. Something sure. like that. Yes. And that happens all the time. As long as doctors can cite to a solid basis in medicine, in research, in the literature, whatever, that supports that indication, that's perfectly fine. What can happen is the marketing of a drug for an off-label use. That's the difference. Prescribing for an off-label use, that's okay. Oh, I see. Marketing for an off-label use not okay from the provider or from the for, well from from the pharmaceutical company or anybody along the chain to that patient so for example um there were a whole lot of lawsuits filed in chicago kind of centralized in chicago against testosterone mm. against testosterone uh, gels some of the you know more popular big pharmaceutical gels uh under the theory that there were two theories to these lawsuits and they there are tons of them, class action lawsuits. Uh, one is that the cardiac risks of testosterone replacement were not adequately presented to the patients. Um, and that was based on some science, which I, and, and you know, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, right. but even as a lay person, having read some of the studies upon which they base these cardiac risks, mm -hmm. even I could say, that doesn't make sense. You know, there there appear to be some risks in certain populations for the beginning part of um, a uh, a new prescription for testosterone replacement. But there's also a lot of evidence that testosterone is cardioprotective. Right. It's actually beneficial. Right. So, you know, th that didn't make a lot of sense. And then the second theory by which these plaintiff class action lawyers went after the testosterone products was based on the idea that um, anti, you know, that age 
you know, men's hypogonadism, in other words, andropause, andro being the androgen, pause right. like menopause. So in other words, the, the uh, illness of low testosterone from an age-related basis in men was an off-label. It, it, was, it was not a valid diagnosis, not a valid disease, and that you were marketing these drugs off-label for something that is not an approved indication, that it wasn't, that this isn't really hypogonadism because it doesn't fit the definition of the criteria for diagnostics for it, but that this was really making up a disease called andropause, right. which doesn't exist, according to them. And, it doesn't have an ICD-10 code, does it? And so that was the the yeah. idea. The idea was it was off-label marketing, and so uh, so that's the distinction: off-label prescribing, fine; off-label marketing, not fine. Interesting. Can you believe we've been our, talking for an hour and a half? I cannot it's believe not possible. It's I cannot believe completely how. impossible. <laughs> and we didn't even cover everything. No, it's the crazy thing. I can think of several things yes. that I have to come back on to share with you. So. Um, I cannot wait for that. And I know that the listener cannot wait for that. It's fantastic. Um, what is so amazing about you, as I said this before, is you really are a unicorn. And, and I think when you are in the presence of someone who has done really great work and really at the pinnacle, it, it's there's a, like I don't want to say vibe or an energy, but a way about you that I think is really profound. And also, I think something that people can learn a lot from. Can I can I put the mirror and, and put that right back on you too? I mean, I I, pay, I I you know slipped him a ten, told him to say that, but and, hardly. And when I hope that when you are going to these talks, that people have the opportunity to interface with you. You know, it's oftentimes never about what someone says; it's really about how they show up. And you have showed up in so many ways. Like you walk in the room, and everyone's like, "Okay, Rick is here," but it's true. And I think that there's a lot to be said for not the lip service, but the action in which and the presence in which an individual shows up. So I just want to say thank you for that. Well, well you're very welcome. And I think that's just being authentic of who you are. Who, who, you know, it, it's easy if you're just authentic to yourself. And um, yeah, I, I hopefully people will will come and see me or hear me. I'm, I'll be at the Mr. Olympia Um there's a uh, like an Olympia master class that we're oh, doing cool. as part of an educational thing. So I'll be there in a couple of weeks in Las Vegas. And then I usually do the Arnold. I speak there. Um, and uh, we have an International Society of Sports Nutrition that I'm yes. a member of. And that's in June. And I usually speak there. So and I write it, you know, I'll I put all the links and I'll you put you know, a link I write to a lot. I'll here. put a few things up. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, follow me. And, and I, I love hearing from folks. And uh, I really thank you for the opportunity. To, to to chat with you. It was super fun and I'm sure we're going to do it yeah. again. And um, yeah, thank you. Yep. And I will talk to you soon. Hopefully Absolutely. not that soon though. <laughs> <laughs>